And uh, actually, they've been developing with the work group uh, through the Department of Health. Okay, is this mic working? Can everybody hear me? The last mic. Everybody in the back? Turn it up. Can we? Is Jim in here? Hello again. All right, so this afternoon we are going to be going over resiliency for the first responder, which is also phase three of our program. So we're going to give you a quick overview of the program. And we will be going to different parts of the state here in the near future, uh, doing a train the trainer class. And then also we'll have the full version of this online at the AZDHS website in the near future as well. So what is resiliency? That's a great definition of it right there. Resiliency is a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. So why is this so important for the first responder? Because we are exposed to traumatic incidents way more than the average civilian is exposed in a lifetime. We see this day in, day out on a regular basis. So why do we bring this up for first responders? It's a cumulative effect of stress. It builds up, it can lead to depression, anxiety, sleep deprivation, and suicidal ideations. So working for Chief Brewster, uh, as we spoke to earlier in the development of our EWP program, this higher? can you hear me? In the development of our EWP program, we had 200 members that we wanted to bring in and train in person with resiliency. And I got a lot of phone calls when uh, we were putting this on the schedule. Nicole, what is resiliency? Why are, why are we doing this? And I could give them these definitions and try to explain it. And the most simple, really, definition that we could come up with was it's bouncing back. It's ability to bounce back from the traumas you see every day and come back to work to go at it again. We believe we've provided a lot of data. We've heard a lot of stories today. Resiliency is a tool that we have in that toolbox one of the best that can combat against those ideations when it comes to suicide. Some of you in this room um, may have heard of the Rudiman Family Foundation. They produced a white paper in 2017, and it made a huge impact in our industry. It was referenced in GEMS, it was referenced in EMS World, and as well as Fire Chief Magazine. And the significant finding that they had and it even made it to Forbes and some others, is that more first responders die by suicide than from in line of duty incidents. So not only is this significant, but what's more significant about this is the paper believes that only 40% of suicides are even reported. Before this was put out, uh, if you talk to anybody, perhaps in this room, we can acknowledge the fact that there is a problem with this in our industry. In 2012, the Chicago chapter of the IAFF did their own internal research. Over 20 years, they looked at the 1,800 deaths that either current members or retired members, when they faced the final, the death. What they found is that if you were a firefighter in their organization, it was 25 times more likely that you would commit suicide compared to the average citizen from CDC statistics. The year before that this report came out in 2016, National Registry of EMT came out with some statistics that said, if you work in EMS, you are 10 times more likely to commit suicide than the regular population. Now, I'm not gonna butcher these data because it's from Dr. Bob Rowe and Vigil who are sitting in our audience today. So um, I'm just gonna kind of skim over this really lightly, if you will. Um, but they did some amazing work, and if you have the opportunity to take a look at that paper, they did work right here in Arizona. And I had a brief conversation with Dr. Bob Rowe in the hall a moment ago, and um, they were talking about how it's more of a ratio, and that they found definitively with their data that EMS, in particular, is more likely to commit suicide. And they took a look at the Arizona Vital Records, 
And what's interesting is that there's no real definitive check box for them to say that it was a suicide. Um, there's a lot of bias around it. This is something we were asked to um, put in here, and it was directly copied from Gems Magazine. However, I've made it a little animated uh, to give a point. And this was based on two questions that was asked to about 4,000 EMS providers. And the questions were, one, have you contemplated suicide? 37% responded yes. Second question, have you made an attempt, a physical attempt at suicide? Close to 7%. Let's think about the general population. What do you think the general population comes to? Mind you, as of this year, suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death in the US. It's on the top 10. We lose 45,000 people every year to death. This is the normal population, 3.7%. We could round that up to four compared to 37. And half a percentage actually made attempts. So this is a really big deal. Um, the reason why Chief Brewster, our department, as well as others that are in this room, are taking these initiatives and sharing on resiliency as a tool is because we know, according to the IAFF, that right now only about 3 to 5% of organizations actually have a suicide prevention program. And not only that, the ones that do usually are larger organizations with funding. So we're doing what we can to provide as many resources and getting feedback on how we can better address it with our members. So resiliency, it's really simple. It's, it's not rocket science. We all have it. We all know that eating right, exercising, mindfulness, as we were spoken to earlier. That was great, Jamie, by the way. You're going to take some work away from me in a little bit, so I appreciate you. Um, but it can be developed and learned by anybody. So working with AZDHS, um, we're really proud of the fact that we're going to be giving you a quick overview today. It was going to be part of a train the trainer in some of the marketing materials. We just don't have enough time to do that today. Um, we are going to be providing it on the website. And then also, it's about a two to three hour course to be resilient and about a four to five hour course to train your trainers. So quick history. I feel like any time you learn something, you should understand why, why you're learning it. So resiliency isn't relatively new. It kind of became a, a tag word in the 1970s. Developed, um, one of the key developers was a doctor by the name of Emily Werner. And she took a look at children. And she was looking at children who were born into dynamic circumstances, maybe a mentally ill mother, economic, socio status, things like that. And what she found is about two thirds of those children were a product of their environment. They would continue to come on, and they would have issues themselves, psychosocial, et cetera. And most of us would go, OK, well, that's a product of your environment. End of study. But she looked at the other question. Why is the other third of these children able to grow up and become contributing to adults to society? What makes them different? And what she found was that those that, again, were in sports, they ate well, they had good nutrition, Maybe they had a mentor or somebody at school that was helping them. Those were the ones that were able to develop those resiliency tools. So we spoke to a little bit about earlier how um, the US Department of the Armed Forces brought this in, and they've been doing training, and they've developed their own programs. Uh, they actually took her work here, uh, the VA, to develop a program in joint with the University of Arizona in Tucson. Again, repeating what we already know. They saw that relaxation, changing perspectives, and reducing stress significantly cut the end-all result of PTSD, which is suicide, is what they deducted. So really quick show of hands um, if you like to sadly watch too much news like I do. Has anybody heard of the PREVENTS initiative that came out last month? Anyone? All right. So PREVENTS initiative. This was um, an executive order put in place by our president. And it's called the President's Roadmap to Empower Veterans and End a National Tragedy of Suicide. Why was this put out there? There's one point something million dollars allotted to it, a special committee. The reason why that's put in place is because there's all these data points um, from some great organizations uh, like Mission 22, because we lose 22 veterans a day on average to suicide. But it came forward because their statistics show that veterans are 1.5 times more likely to commit suicide 
than the average person. So I'm gonna brain, brain jog you for a second back to what I said a moment ago. Our statistics are greatly higher in EMS. And so that's why we're calling out to make it a priority to make these changes. So as you can see, <clears throat> this is gaining some attention. People are talking about this by evidence of the covers of these publications here. You see, what role does stress play in EMS? Before it's too late. Addressing firefighter mental health. So, publicly, um, back up here. So why is this important for us? Because we are a different breed in EMS. We have different personality traits. So, why is resiliency different for first responders? We are exposed to more trauma on a regular basis than the average population. We know that, we talked about that earlier. We also have key personality traits that often, um, go back on that slide. Sorry. Point. <laughs> we also have key personality traits that different from, diff, different from civilians that play a big role in identifying and understanding resiliency. So, these are some of the personality traits. We're controllers, action-oriented. We typically run towards danger when people run away. Risk-takers, thrill-seekers, the list goes on. So, how does the public perceive us? They look at us as being responsive, heroic. They put us up on this pedestal. They have certain expectations of us. We have certain expe expectations of ourselves. And therefore, sometimes it makes it difficult for us to seek help because the stigma that's associated around it. So it's interesting, last year, the International Association of Firefighters put out a survey and still to this day, 92% of firefighters say stigma is a barrier to seeking mental health. So let's talk about the different types of stress. So we have the physical stress, tense muscles, clenching your teeth, headaches, loss of sleep. Then we have our cognitive stress, or thinking, anxious thoughts, fearful anticipation, poor concentration. Then we go into emotional types of stress, which is feelings of tension, irritability, and so on. And then we have behavioral types of stress, avoidance of tasks, uh, difficulty in completing assignments, addictive tendencies. And then we have our spiritual or perceptual stress, which is denouncing your faith, maybe changing your worldview, those type of things. And then we have our psychosocial stress, which you may have an underlying medical condition that's being exacerbated by some sort of underlying mental problem that you're having. So you're making it worse. So definitions of stressor. This is a stimulus that causes or recalls a negative response to situations or conditions. This is a precursor to distress. Distress is a term that applied to stress the negative dysfunctional force that can to lead to disease and the erosion of your health. An example of a stressor would be a pediatric code or pediatric drowning. And distress would be the sleep deprivation that follows that. And now we talk about cumulative stress. This is all the stressors that build up over time, a stress arousal that slowly builds up and leads to a condition called burnout. So, the best way to describe this is your bucket is overflowing. So you have a bucket, the stress is your water, it's filling the bucket, 
And if you don't have any way to deal with it, it starts to overflow and affect your life in a negative way. So with resiliency, it allows us to tap that bucket, drain off some of that stress. Good resiliency skills open the tap that drains the stress. Lack of resiliency skills closes the tap, and the water fills the bucket, and it overflows. Simple analogy. So, burnout. Basically, a state of physical exhaustion caused by long-term exposure. And as you can see up here, these are some of the signs. Detachment. Increase in patience or irritability. Basically, you don't have the bandwidth to deal with things. Paranoia, depression, suicidal thinking, and psychosomatic complaints like we talked about earlier. So some of the red flags to burnout are maybe you have an employee that otherwise does a good job and all of a sudden they start to have some disciplinary problems. You're starting, they're, they're coming up on your radar. You have increased sick time usage. Those are things you need to look for. And a pattern of showing up late. So these are all signs of burnout. So we go through the different definitions of stress and, and why do we do that in a resiliency training? The reason is, is that it's really imperative that you recognize not only what the stressors are, what distress is, what cumulative stress is, and how it affects burnout, but also so that as managers and peers, we can address those in others. And so how does this affect us? Like, really, stress is stress. Everybody has stress, right? Some are good, some are bad. Well, we spoke to earlier, I, I stated that suicide is now one of the leading causes of death. That's from stress but it also affects things that we know. We're all healthcare providers in this room. Um, anything from heart issues, cancers, liver issues, accidents, so that stand up 24, stand up 28, driving home because of sleep deprivation, that's a leading cause of death. We're at the top six here. Not only that, but OSHA has now declared stress as a hazard of the workplace and specific to public safety. So the different stresses in EMS, it's, it's no secret that we have a different line of work. We are constantly exposed to high stress incidents. Uh, Chief Rooster spoke to this uh, in his first presentation. Normal civilians don't have this many stressors. We do. And not only that, uh, Jamie went through and she was talking about how you had your fight, flight response, different parts of your brain that work. Well, we confuse that natural rhythm. There are times when we are highly aware when we shouldn't need to be, like when we're sleeping because we're waiting for those tones to go off. Or we suppress those because we've been to so many emergencies, what would normally stress a civilian out on a car accident scene, we're just like, okay, another day at work. These can be triggered at any time, whether that's by sight, by sound, by smell. I know we've all been cooking at home, right, with a family and there's some show on and like tones go off on the on the show and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, time to go. We trigger differently than the normal public. And a story that I've, I've shared with my chief and ironically I've heard almost the same story from other providers is I remember holding C-spine for a gentleman that didn't have a helmet and feeling the fragments of his skull underneath my gloves. I hate picking up things like bags of rice and beans and things like that because I hate the crepitus feeling. Blood, vomit, gore, I don't care. But that feeling to me, that triggers something for me that I don't like to do. And that's different. My, my husband would never pick up something and go like, oh, that's terrible. But I do. So, <clears throat> different types of stress in EMS. Sleep interruption. We're all familiar with this. If you're on the truck still, you're getting up at night, your sleep is interrupted. It's hard to get in that rhythm. Heightened state of awareness. You know, we constantly operate in the red. You go to bed at night, you lay down, you know, at any given point, tones can drop and you're responding to something. It could be a working fire, it could be a code, whatever it is, we're always in the red. Team responsibility. 
You know, we all have our, our role. We all want to make sure that we fulfill our role. But we also have our teammates that we want to make sure fulfill their role. So we have the stress of not only making sure we do our job, but that they do theirs as well. And then we have unfamiliar locations. Pretty much any call that we run on, it's a different set of circumstances, it's a different call, and, and you know, we don't know what's around the corner when you walk in that house. So you gotta be always aware. So that hides it. And then changes in heart rate, the physical effects. Tones drop, heart rate increases. You're sound asleep, boom, you go from zero to 60 in a matter of seconds. This has personally affected me as far as the heart rate goes. Um, I have a history now of AFib, which my cardiologist and doc says is definitely related to the job. In fact, I've been cardioverted seven times. That's not fun. And now I'm on medication for the rest of my life because of it. So that's a physical stress from the job. So compassion fatigue. Basically, the reduced interest in being empathetic. You just don't have the ability to relate at that point in time. Um, an example of this, so my wife comes home, this has been a few months ago. She's all upset, she says, a good friend of mine is dying of cancer. Grew up with this person, she's all upset. I looked at her, I said, that's horrible, honey. That's awful, I feel bad. And I walked out of the room. Well, that wasn't the response she was looking for. <laughs> yeah, she goes, that, that's kind of cold. I said, well, I feel bad for you. I mean, I don't, want you, I don't know what you want me to do. I want you to be compassionate. So that's an example. So, am I vulnerable to compassion? Are you? So these are some of the categories. And you don't have to fall into every one of them to be vulnerable. We're all exposed to trauma. Okay, do you have limited work satisfaction? Poor support systems, we talked about that earlier. So do any of you fall into these categories? Now, differentiating stress from PTSD. So here's some of the stressors here. We have anxiety, depression, trouble sleeping, withdrawal. These are work-related stress symptoms, which can manifest into worse symptoms and become PTSD symptoms. So now you have all these stressors building up and now you start to have these changes. Dysregulation and cortisol output. Emotional reactivity. Always being on guard for danger. And this is diagnosed by a licensed clinician. So it, it's a ton of symptoms and we're, we're looking at a patient hypothetically. What can we do to prevent that? So to the beginning where I started speaking is we can do that through resiliency by being proactive. And through our quest, we met with a lot of different organizations and, and did a lot of research. And when it comes to resiliency, there's dozens of skills out there. And we've mentioned some of them today. There's a book out there online. It's called First Response Resiliency. Um, Dr. Callan, uh, Mike Grill, and Dr. Marks put this book out there. It's a free resource. You can download it. We actually make copies for everyone in our organization. And what's awesome about it, and he's gonna get mad at me when I say this, it's firefighter proof. Um, <laughs> because it, it goes through and it, and it says the objectives, and it goes through tools, and what the outcomes can be by walking through activities step by step. In this book, as an example, there's 13 different tools, and us coming out, or some of the others that are here today who teach resiliency, um, that's a lot of steps to go through in a training. We like, we love our acronyms, right? Whether you're a medic or an ENT, we love the acronyms. So we came up with this little creative thing um, called resiliency shoes. So we look at it in five different categories. Supportive relationships, healthy coping strategies, 
optimism, emotional awareness, and then providing physical skills. And again, this is a two and a half hour class. I'm going to breeze through these like I want to run out the door. It's all an essence of time, I assure you. So um, first things first, supportive relationships. Uh, this is an exercise that one of our mentors did with us. I'm going to ask you to do it now. You take one of those pieces of paper in front of you. I want you to imagine that on your way here today, you blew a tire or you needed gas. Quick jot as fast as you can all the people you would call to help you with that. I'm sure it's going to get pretty long. You have friends, you have family, maybe AAA, you have your coworkers, a boss, maybe you have some kids, teenagers that would love to get out of school to help you. I don't know. That list gets pretty long. Now let's think about you have a teenager at home and we love social media and you can tell that your teenager is starting to have some suicidal ideations just by the posts that they're putting out there. Does that list get smaller of who you call for that need and help? What if it's you? Does that list get smaller again, if at all? So what we do, and working through the EWP, the process that we put together, having peers, having resources, is talking about where those supportive relationships lie. Where are those trusted, confidential, supportive relationships? And how do you access more help? Additionally, when we go through this training, we like to um, talk about the different options that are out there, some that are free, some that are internal, some that are national. Those are resources in your books for you as well, if you want to take a look at them. And then we also look at uh, evaluating what our supportive relationships are. So let's say you play softball every Tuesday night. That's awesome. You're going to release some stress, hit some balls.